<laughs> Josh, thank you for being with me today to let everybody know who's listening to this. This is our third time starting this thing. It's, it's been on my fault. But tell everybody who you are and what you do. Thank you so much, Andy. Uh, my name is Josh Summers, and uh, I'm the guy that's behind All Things Secured, which is a YouTube channel. It's a website, uh, really a brand that's dedicated to taking what I think to be complex and difficult security and privacy issues and really breaking them down for people so that, you know, my mom or my dad could hopefully watch or read what I'm talking about and, and then be able to implement it in some way. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. And that's important because there are people out there like me who have to use technology every day. And then all of a sudden it gets complicated and there are people like you there to help us understand what's going on. Exactly. And the, the um, you would think that there would be a ton of resources out there. Uh, and sometimes there are, you know, but uh, it really just breaking it down step by step, I find uh, is, is something that a lot of people really, really want. And it's not as, it's, it's not as good as, as you would want it to be most of the time. Right. You know, um, you've been dealing with technology for a long time. It has come so far just in my lifetime alone. We're now using stuff that we used to see on Star Trek and now that stuff that we have every day. Um, so with all of this advancement in technology, how has privacy changed? Yeah, it's changed quite a bit, obviously. Um, really, I think the, the change that has happened is really putting the onus more on us. So it mm. used to be that, that privacy was almost like a default where yeah. as long as you just did the status quo, you had privacy. But I think now privacy is something that you have to actively pursue, that you have to go after. Um, you know, I, I used to live out in Western China, which is um, what most people would consider. It's very politically sensitive. It's, it's just a, a, it was a crazy place to live, to be honest. But what I learned from living there was it kind of became China's testing ground for all kinds of surveillance, mm -hmm. all kinds of surveillance technology, whether that was facial recognition, whether that was uh, just, you know, tracking your, your financial transactions through, you know, digital apps and all that stuff. And it really was kind of this wake up call for me to say, wow, this is where we're headed. Right. I mean, it, it's a testing ground for China, but, but really this is a trend that we're seeing all around the world. And it's, it's, again, one of those things where now that default of privacy is being taken away. And the default is you're being tracked and you're being monitored and you're being watched. And so to actually get that privacy, it's something that you have to actively seek out. Right. And, and I agree with you. And we're going to talk more about your China experience uh, a little bit later on here. But um, give us an example, like if what kind of data is being collected about us when we click on like a banner ad on a website, kind of typically, well, it's different for every website, I understand. Typically, uh, what kind of information is being collected about us, at, at just doing something that simple? Yeah, I mean, this is really to the best of my understanding at this point, because I'm not a, an expert on, on what goes into a lot of the advertising things that happen. But let's say that you click on an ad that's been served by Google AdServe, which is probably one of the most popular ad publishers on the web right now. Uh, so what that ad, what that uh, company can do is they can target you very specifically based on what you're asking for. Uh, and so that helps them know that the person that is clicking through is hopefully going to be somebody that is interested in the product they're, they want to sell. But at the same time, because of the fact that this is Google that's serving that ad, Google has so much information that they're gathering on you, whether you really have consented to it or not. You know, whether that's where you came from on the web to land on that web page, the search term that you used, the type of browser that you're using right at this moment, even sometimes your location, like all of these different things, you and I as website owners, I mean, it's, it's, somewhat easy for us to know this because I can log into my analytics and, and see all mm -hmm. of this information. Uh, and in some ways it feels helpful, but in other ways it feels a little bit invasive, even if, even if I know that it's supposedly, you know, like it's, it's not personally identifiable information, you know, that PII that we hear about. Right. And you, you bring up a good point. You and I both do own websites. And I know with my site, with my analytics, I've turned a lot of it off simply because I do want to respect the privacy of the people that come to my site. But there's a lot of it because I did not personally build the website myself. It's hosted by someone else. They take information that I don't necessarily get control of or see or, or am able to turn off. So it's not like you and I being website uh, providers here, 
it's not like we're trying to personally see what's going on. I'm not personally trying to hack your phone to see what your camera is showing. Um, there's still yeah. good people on the internet like us, right? I would, I would like to think so. And even the company <laughs> that's serving, you know, that, that's paying for this ad, all they want is a targeted customer, right? Yeah. And they're just taking advantage of what they have available to them. And I think, and I honestly, you know, I'm of the mindset. I know that there's a lot of people that think that big tech is just evil and, and it's just, it's out there, but it's the economics of it all. You know, they profit from being as detailed in how they can target you as possible. And, and in some ways, some people like being targeted too. And I mean, I, it's not necessarily me, but some people like when that perfect ad comes up mm. and if that's you, more power to you. But I think <laughs> that a lot of us, it, it, it kind of scares us to realize that there's that much data that's being collected on us. And, and we don't even know how much data that is. Right. And that's true. It, it's kind of, um, we, we don't know exactly what it is or what it does. One of the videos that you did um, that I really appreciated brought up a very good point, And I want you to explain what you're saying here, because I hear this all the time from my friends and from family. When it comes to online privacy, they're like, I don't care. I don't have anything to hide. I'm not that interesting. So they might as well collect this data. What do you say to people who say that to you? Yeah. I mean, and that is probably one of the most common things that you hear related to security and privacy. And I, before I dive into the answer, I think one of the reasons why people say that is not necessarily because they believe it. I mm. think it's because it feels overwhelming to try to do anything about it. And so yeah. it's just easier to say, you know what? I don't care. It, I don't have anything to hide anyway. So it, it's less about the argument of I don't have anything to hide and more about the, wait a second. So do I have to use identity monitoring? Do I have to use a VPN? Do I have to use a password manager? Like all of a sudden you start throwing all this stuff at people. And, and I know my parents, for example, just go, yeah, you know what? Uh, it's just not worth it. I don't care if they mm -hmm. track me. Um, but the truth is, you know, when you're talking about privacy and security. There's really three things that you're, you're looking at. You're looking at what assets do you have, both tangible and intangible that are of value to you, right? Intangible being something like your identity, tangible being something like money, right? Things, savings, investments, stuff like that. And then risks that you have. And this is where a lot of people get caught up because our threats, I guess, would be the better way to say it. Threats to some of those assets. And a lot of people get caught up in this, well, you know, I don't think the government is, you know, necessarily out to get me, even though, you know, Snowden and all this stuff, I, I just don't know. So I don't really have that big threat. I don't have enough money for people to care. But I think what people don't realize is that those threats do exist. And, and the fact that you haven't actually worked through to figure out what they are is usually the reason why you don't see your assets as valuable, because it's when you mm. put those two together that that third piece comes in, which you ask, all right, so then how do I protect these assets against these threats that I think are real? And my threats might be different than yours, which are different from everybody else, you know, anybody else that's watching or listening to this right now. So I think you don't realize you know, for example, with our identity, we often don't realize how valuable that can be, how much damage it can do to us, and not just us, but our children or our, you know, family members around us, if something like that gets stolen. Um, and so, yeah, when you when you look at it like that, you know, there's a, a pretty well-known quote from Edward Snowden who said, you know, for those people that don't, you know, like uh, you know, don't think they have anything to hide. It's kind of like saying, oh, you know, I'm just going to do away with free speech because right now I've got nothing to say. Mm. But the reality is, is that privacy is one of those things that once you give it up, it's kind of like a secret that once you say it, you can't take it back. Right. You know, it's one of those things that once, once it's out there, you can't take it back. And so I would rather err on the side of caution, not conspiratorial like paranoia, but really just err on the side of caution so that I can at least control a little bit of my privacy going forward. Right. And you made, you made a lot of good points then. And um, you, you made a really good point about, well, would you post your credit card information online? You know, yeah. that's the kind of level of privacy that you're talking about here. So if you wouldn't yeah. post your credit card number online, you do care a little bit about your privacy. Yeah. yeah. 
I mean, if you lock your door at night, or if you just put blinds and close your blinds, like, I don't want someone peering into my bedroom. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I want some level of privacy. And uh, unfortunately, for most of us, we don't know what that line is until it gets crossed. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh my gosh, somebody's looking at my stuff. I don't like that, you know? Mm -hmm. And then you start thinking, oh, well, there's my line. Uh, but it, I think there's value in trying to discover that line before it gets crossed. Right. You know, there's a, um, a lot of companies that have gotten kind of in trouble here of late lately. Uh, Life360 was one of them that said that they were selling all of this uh, data to uh, data brokers and things like that. But they say they strip personal identifiers from the data that they collect. But how hard is it really to kind of reverse engineer that to try to find real people in all that data. Yeah, and uh, I don't know if you know John Oliver, he's a comedian yes. on mm -hmm. television. Did you see this recent bit? That yes, he did? I did, I loved it. I thought it was great and it really was uh, well done in the way that it was both presented and you know the, the, the whole thing that he put together. So in short, I don't wanna, if you really wanna go watch it, I recommend mm -hmm. you do on YouTube somewhere, but, but in short, what he did is he basically went through and um, you know, did that. He stripped the, the, the information from uh, an ad that he did in a, in a very specific part of Washington, DC. And what you realize once, even if you strip out all that data, is that you can still go in and pinpoint, you know, based on a lot of different factors, right? So let's say that I completely strip out all the identifiable information from your phone, right? So that it doesn't say Andy in any mm -hmm. part of it, right? Oh, so great. All you are is just this random number. Well, if your phone gives you GPS data where you are from 10 p.m. until 8 a.m. And then it gives you your data of where you went, you know, this grocery store from whatever. And then, you know, like I can really easily triangulate. Okay, well, I may not know it's Andy, but I know the guy lives right here. Mm -hmm. I know that he shops at these stores. And, and it's just, it's really, it's, it's a misnomer to say that, oh, it's stripped of personally identifiable information. Really, all it is is stripping your name off of it or, or maybe even your computer's IP address. But the reality is, is all that data is still there with more than enough connecting points to say with reasonable confidence, okay, I may not know it's your name, this person, but I can assume a lot about you based on this information. Right. And I'm so glad that you brought up the John Oliver thing. I shared that with a lot of my followers. It was it's a 25 minute clip and it's absolutely worth uh, watching. But yes. at the end, basically, he kind of um, it's not really catfishing. He was searching for people who were potential politicians and he was actually yes. able to go and locate three of these politicians who were in the Capitol building when they either clicked on information or he was able to triangulate down the three of the people that yes. we got with these banner ads were actually in the Capitol building. And so my first thought was, I'm pretty sure foreign governments are doing this kind of thing right now. And number two, doesn't this make it an issue of national security? Shouldn't we have a law against this sort of thing? <laughs> I know. And, and the, one of the points he was making that I thought was genius because it, it goes back to kind of what we were, I was saying earlier, which is that law is not going to happen until it hurts personally. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, we're not going to care about privacy until it hurts personally. Lawmakers aren't going to care about this until they're the ones that are their Their information is being publicly made uh, available. And that's when it's like, Whoa, wait a second. We need to make a law that says you can't do this. <laughs> you right. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't know, maybe, maybe John Oliver is going to be this huge champion for online privacy. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll find <laughs> out. Um, so yeah. one of the things that I wanted to ask about um, is it talks this is about our kids. They are digital mm -hmm. citizens from the minute that they are born. Now, what do you think privacy is going to look like for our kids 20 years from now? Yeah, I mean, it, it continues to just like if, if you just take the trajectory, the current trend line, um, it's not hard to see that it's it's going to be much harder down the line. Now, I, I could see there being changes, you know, we've got the GDPR for Europe, and maybe that's going to kind of bleed over into something that that we have in the United States. Um, but I still think it's going to be this this fight that has to be uh, continually 
battled uh, both you know, our personal devices and even just with our information out and about. I mean, I currently monitor my sons. I've got two boys. I monitor their social security numbers, you mm -hmm. know, and hopefully, you know, it's, it's a rare occurrence, but still it's one of those things where I want to make sure that I at least put them in the best footing possible, you know, that they are, that they've got uh, everything going for them when they, when they get off on their own. And one of those would hopefully be that they've got a clean, you know, identity that they can use, mm -hmm. clean, clean credit that they can use. Um, and yeah, it's, it's one of those things where I think, especially for kids nowadays, like they're growing up in an era where um, it's, it is kind of this, like I grew up, let's say, you know, in the, let's say nineties or two thousands, right. When the internet was just starting, right. Mm -hmm. And you didn't know that you shouldn't post all this stuff online right. and it comes back to bite you nowadays. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I've got my sons and, and they will hopefully understand that there is, there is something that you need to be careful about when you're working. Like we we've, we've lived through that now as parents mm -hmm. and hopefully we can pass that on to our kids. Um, but they're going to have an uphill battle no matter how you slice it because um, yeah, there, these, the way that let's say Google's business model or Facebook's business model or name whatever company that's going to be big in 20 years, we don't know what that is right now, but they're going to have to evolve their way of tracking, uh, mm -hmm. their way of, of targeting ads, uh, because that's, that is their primary business model. And, and, and maybe that'll change. Maybe the business model will change. Uh, but it's clear based on the way things are right now, that again, like I said at the very beginning, privacy will have to be something that our kids actually do themselves, that, that they have to make all those changes, that they have to make sure that they're monitoring certain things and, and, um, and not giving out information that they shouldn't be giving because that's, it's constantly going to be a, a desire. To, it's going to be asked of them. They're going to, it's, yeah, it's going to be just part of the culture. Yeah, part of the culture. Absolutely, it is. One of the things that I have been encouraging parents to do here of late, and I want to hear your take on this, is we have to raise our kids to understand that the way they act online needs to be congruent with how they act as a person at school, at church, wherever you go. You have to still be that person online because, you know, Josh, you and I, we're older than the Internet. And uh, when we first <laughs> got the Internet, it was like, hey, we could do whatever we want. But for our kids, that's just not the case. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. I think um, it, with, with kids, it, it's just really a, a, something that I do think it's the responsibility of us as parents to be able to, to pass on that, that kind of, of um, knowledge, that kind of skill set of knowing how to do that. Um, and I think it goes beyond just security and privacy. I mean, I know that you probably think this is a dad as well, but part of saying that, right, hey, I want mm. you to be congruent with who you are online and who you are in person mm. is just actually good, solid human being advice. Yes. You know, hey, yes. let's let's not be one person different over here and one person over there. Like that's something that that's worthwhile for anybody, whether it's online or whether it's, hey, I'm I look, I try to put on this air when I'm at church and I and I mm -hmm. do something else when I'm when I'm with my friends. Like that kind of, of model to teach our kids is is worthwhile, whether or not it has to do with privacy, but it matters even more when we're talking about the way that we put our data online. Right. So speaking of, you know, putting our data online, I'm sure that there's going to be some people who've listened to this and are like, wow, I really need to, to take this more seriously. What are some tools that families can use to better protect their online privacy? Yeah, I mean, there are, honestly, there are way too many tools out there. Uh, and and the, the problem, I think, like I said at the beginning, is that if you throw too many out, then people just kind of shut down. Right. Um, and, you know, the, the ones that, you know, when I talk to my parents and they're asking me, hey, what are, what are the bare essentials that I need to do? Um, you know, and this is, this is important to me, right? And mm -hmm. because there's, there's about to be one of the biggest wealth transfers in the world when that generation of my parents passes down, you know, and, and, and there's an inheritance that happens. Uh, I want to make sure that my parents are, are actually wise in how they secure their, their finances and how they, mm -hmm. you know, and how they handle their own privacy. Um, and one of the, I mean, the easiest primary ways that you can do that is just by making sure that you have a strong, um, 
uh, login for, for anything mm -hmm. having to do with online, but particularly with your banking, with your finances, with um, even social media. There's a lot that can be done uh, on your social media account. Um, for me, that means a password manager. I really love using a password manager. It helps me create stronger passwords. Uh, and then of course, stores it in the vault and, and all that stuff. And, you know, there, there are people that think there's risk to using, you know, master password behind or, you know, a master password right, to, to right. lock up everything. Um, I think there are ways around that. And I've done some, you know, videos about, you know, ways that you can um, mitigate that kind of risk. But uh, that's, that's one of the primary tools that I think, and then that's actually a paid one. There are free versions, um, I guess, mm -hmm. of, of different password managers, but it's the small things like, hey, did you know if you're a US citizen, you have the right to check your credit score um, once a year and there's three credit bureaus. So mm -hmm. you can do that once every four months and it's free and it doesn't take you that much. Just set a calendar reminder once every four months to go into Experian, to TransUnion, to Equifax and to go check your credit and make sure that there's nothing weird on it, right? Just do mm -hmm. a scan, mm -hmm. do it of you and your wife, and then go through and do that. Like th those are like the little things that you can do. Um, and then the last one I would say, this is one that um, uh, I think people kind of go back and forth with me on, um, but I'm, I'm a pretty strong advocate for actually going in and freezing your credit. Yep. Um, this, I think, and, and mind you, a lot of the audience that I want to really reach is the older generation, right? So not necessarily people in their 20s, even though hopefully, you know, the stuff that I write and, and publish can, and on YouTube will be beneficial to anybody. But, but really, when you're getting older, like setting that credit freeze, I, I don't see a downside to doing that, mm -hmm. right? I don't often go out and get new credit. You know, I don't yeah. know how often you do it, but it's like, okay, well, if I were to go out and buy a car and I needed credit, it takes an hour to unthaw, you know, what they mm -hmm. call thaw the, the freeze. Right. Right. But doing a freeze basically means just going into all three of those credit bureaus. And even if you're not a U.S. citizen, you know, a lot of this stuff is being tracked, you know, TransUnion, Equifax, they track people globally, believe it or not. And you can say, hey, do like put a freeze. You cannot sell my data. That's a big one. Believe it or not, Equifax, TransUnion, and and um, what's the third one? I just said it. Uh, Experian. Equifax, TransUnion and Experian. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, they have they have the right to, or they don't have the right. They part of their they business model it. is selling your data. Yep. They do it. Yeah. Yep. By setting a freeze, not only do you do you say, is that saying to them, Hey, you can't uh, allow credit to be um, issued in my name anymore, but it also actually stops them from being allowed to sell any of your data. Uh, and both, again, that's something that you can do absolutely for free. And so I don't see why you wouldn't know. I think those three are, are big ones for me. I'm sure that, you know, we could argue about others that are also really, really important, but uh, I'd say those are some big ones. Right. And I'm, I'm really happy you brought up the thing about freezing credit. I actually froze my son's credit because um, he's nine because yeah. he doesn't need it right now. <laughs> I actually did a, yeah. a show about it. Uh, I even did a download downloadable guide. It was like, here's the steps that I followed. It all works. I had to print all yes. these things out and mail it. Um, and, and people were like, wow, that's weird, Andy. Why did you do a show on that? And I'm like, because it's important. And I'm so glad that you have said yes. that. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. Very cool. Well, um, Josh, you are going to stick around with me and you're going to uh, talk a little bit more about your experience in China. But as we wrap up okay. this show, tell people how they can find out more about you and everything that you're doing. Yeah. Uh, if you want to follow along, my primary means of communication really right now is on YouTube. And I'm also on Twitter quite a bit. So you can find me on YouTube at All Things Secured. Uh, that's also the website, allthingssecured.com. And then on Twitter, it's all underscore secured. Uh, and yeah, you can reach out to me there if you've got any questions. And I'm usually pretty good about responding on Twitter, at least a lot better than on email. <laughs> that's true. All right, buddy. I appreciate you and all that you're doing. Thank you for your time today, buddy. Yeah. Thanks so much, Andy.